Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Y Charts Financial Advisors. Listen up. There's this new tool that they built. It's called Scenarios. And what you can do with this tool is you can look at different scenarios, just like it says. If you want to th think about- Good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> investing uh, money either with uh, uh, DCA, dollar cost, averaging. dollar cost averaging, lump sum, contributions, distributions, what if this, what if that. Yeah. Portfolio withdrawals, all that stuff. So I guess previously you could have done you could have done this. I mean, we've done this a million times with Excel, pain in the butt. This makes it very easy. If you want to learn more, and if you're a new subscriber, you want to get 20% off a discount off the subscription, uh, visit ycharts.com, tell them Animal Spirits sent you. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. We're gonna start the show off with two quick announcements. One, future proof. We're back. The registration is now available. What is Future Proof? Ben, how would you describe Future Proof? It was the greatest financial event I've ever been to in my life. It's Me too. beach, food, booze, music, and some music <laughs> hanging out with us, and a bunch of finance talk. And it was awesome. It was it was the, the most fun I've had at a finance event in my life. And I think the fact that we've done it once already means that next year is going to be even better. Yeah, thousands well, of people will be there. Some Tons screws of advisors, to tighten up, and big speakers, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Uh, so registration is now available. We'll link to this all over the show notes. You'll see it in the future. It's in September. I don't know the exact dates, but it's not hard to find. So we are excited, can't wait, and we'll see many of you there. All right, that's number one. Number two, Ridholtz Wealth Management is looking for a power planner, a junior associate, a junior advisor, whatever you want to call it. We're looking for this, if, if you are, but there's a, there's a catch. We need somebody who's in the Pacific Northwest. That is the upper left-hand corner of this great country. Seattle, Portland, those kind of areas. If you are in and around that area of the country and you're looking to grow into uh, an advisory role and uh, it would help if you had a little bit of experience, if you're, if you're interested, you know where to find us. Actually, where do they find us? Well, just email Is it hiring at? Yeah, hiring at RedHoltWealth.com. Or email don't us email. Hey. No, no, no. Do you think? No, no, no. Okay. Hiring at RedHoltWealth.com. So besides paraplanner and paralegal, what else does para get put in front of? Is that Shoot. it? Parachute. Ah. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty good. <laughs> Paranormal. All right. You had a piece. Wait, I have one, I have one more. Paranormal. Okay. Okay. Paranormal. There you go. Not bad. I could keep going. Just no, I can't. I'm not, I bet you saw all no. twelve of those movies. I, 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 well, I stopped at four. The first I one was, was a classic. Was Truly good. scary. You had a piece last week, I believe, called the Narr narrative vortex, talking about how we're doing the snip snap back and forth. Stocks are down. Oh, that week means recession is imminent. <laughs> week to week, day stocks to day. Stocks are up. stocks are up, but that means inflation is falling, and we have a soft landing possibility, and. I, we did this a little bit last year, but it feels like this year it's going to just continue where we go back and forth between no matter what the stock market does or the bond market, people are going to be looking at that and trying to figure out a signal to, okay, this means this regime is over, this is the new one, and that's what people want. They want they want to have some finality to the market. Wait, can I just know, okay, just this one is point it. there, one point there. I, I agree that um, the first half of 2022, probably the spring time into the summer where you had a lot of bear market rallies, there was a lot of back and forth. But I think maybe towards the second half of the year, I don't want to say reality set in, but the narrative was firmly yes. – there was it was True. a one-sided narrative. This is bad, yeah. Inflation yeah, it was, is bad. It was a one-sided narrative. But now that we've bounced so much and inflation is coming down and rates are coming down and stocks are bouncing – so yeah, we're 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 back to uh, we're bouncing all over the place. Ping pong. And the thing balls. is, as inflation falls, if it continues to fall, both sides are going to be able to hold on to their argument as hard as they can because okay, it's falling because things are getting better and this is a soft landing. Or no, 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 it's falling because this means you're going to recession. And so you're, you're just probably not going to know for a long time what this actually means. So far, be it for me to make a short-term market call. It's not what I'm doing here. I'm just gonna just throwing it out. Just want your opinion, prediction man. of the week. Just 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 asking questions. Uh, did we go, did we, was this bounce? Is this bounce warranted? Feels, feels like it's a, it's a, it's a, health, it's a healthy size bounce. Too far, too fast? How far away off the here? bottom? How far off the lows? 
Uh, I want to say October twelfth like, will. Is that fair? October something. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying like in January. You know what I mean? Oh, so the stock market is up five percent year to date. So the Nasdaq's up eight percent. It's January twenty fourth. Strong month. Too much? It down, Warranted? It was down, it was down 30% yeah. last year. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm not... I don't know. The, the big moves don't really surprise me either way anymore. Well, how, how about this? How about this? What, uh, let, me, let me be specific. So one of the stocks that I own, and this is not to brag, we don't brag around here, but Facebook, for example. I'm using this as an example. This stock over the you last... You Facebook? Yeah, I bought it at $2.99. Okay. Uh... You know what? Maybe I should do some more bragging. You don't even know that I'm on Facebook. All right. So, so since since Facebook bottomed, when was this? Let's go back to November. Since Facebook bottomed, it is up fifty eight percent. And actually, I think I literally bought the bottom again. It's not about me. It's not about me. But my question to you is, what sort of earnings, or maybe reduction in spending, or guidance will Facebook have to deliver? In order for the stock to not go down eleven percent. Well, the weird you know what thing I mean. Is, like, there's, but the, my point is, there's a lot of stocks like this that are up a massive amount off the lows. Is it justified? It's hard to tell because some of these stocks are down so much. Because so, Facebook, you said is up fifty eight percent. It's still down sixty two percent from all time highs. So you say, man, that's a huge bounce. But you also got to say, well, that's coming off of a very low level. Same thing with Netflix. What is Netflix? Netflix has probably doubled at least, Listen, maybe more. You, you, you said it, not me. So if Netflix, another another stock uh, that's in my portfolio, my repertoire, my wheelhouse. I would have, I would actually on TCAF last week, I said I'm fully prepared for the stock to fall 8% after hours just because it's run up so much. Well, it's up 13% since it reported earnings. So uh, what do I know? This is, I guess maybe this is just kind of luck, but they were both down 76% from the highs at their... At their low. Now, Netflix, this is this is different because Netflix legitimately smashed expectations. I, I have a very hard time seeing Facebook with an upside surprise. You know what I mean? But the, what if the expect? I think it's going to be harder to gauge the stock market based on individual names that are down 75 or 80%. Mm, yeah, because, good point. Because how, how could expectations be any lower for a stock that's down 80%? So I think it's going to be hard to gauge what that means for the market for a while. If you have a stock double after it's down 80%, it's still got a long ways to go to make all the money back. Okay, here's another example of of stocks having a a heck of a run. Carl Quintanilla tweeted, this looks like it's from Deutsche Bank. Yes, it is. Best start to the year for the year of stock 600 since Bloomberg data began in 1987. It's up 8% uh, in just the first three odd weeks of the year. I saw data this morning. I I, I haven't had a time to check on it. Uh, I think it was PMI data in Europe that is actually accelerating. So maybe Europe is avoiding a recession. Do you know what the total return for European stocks is for the past 10 years? For total return of uh, 40%. Okay, well, let's, uh, IFA is up 60% over the last 10 years, 5% per year. It's not terrible. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not U.S., but... No, okay, but, but I'm but, saying it's, it's, not like, it's not like stocks overseas have been crushing it. The fact that they're having a big snapback, I mean, the S&P is up over 200% in, over the last 10 years. Listen, I, I am, I'm in, admittedly, I'm, I, this is short-term thinking here. I don't condone this. I'm just... Just asking the question. So here's another example. XHB, housing-related stocks, is on a monster run, and we're going to talk about some housing stuff later today. Is, uh, is, is this run, uh, is it too much? Maybe not. Maybe. I, I just think if you get violent downturns, you're going to get violent upturns too, and it's going to be hard to know, is this, is this the weird dead cat bounce thing, or is this, this a true bull market i don't know true by the way this is a waste of time but listen we're we're just talking right just talking this is, trying to this is what this is what the podcast is about you and this oh, you yeah. and i would have done this on the phone before we had a podcast <laughs> just try to have some fun um all right so, so uh uh individual investors have been doubling down on tesla they spent more money on tesla in the past six months than in the past five years prior in january net purchases hit a one-day record that's kind of crazy and i guess they're buying what elon's been dumping uh, so the stock got as low as a hundred bucks and this was like massive, massive volume. So, uh, the stock, so if, bounced- if they really wanted to have NFTs that worked, couldn't you do an NFT of a stock share saying I bought this stock share from Elon Musk when he was selling it to, that's a great use case. A, I love it. I love the use case. Um, so, so Tesla got as low as a hundred, uh, and it 
bounce to 140, so 40% run in like, what is this? I don't know, 10 sessions or something. Here's another stock that was down 74% of the lows. Still down 65%, even after that huge run-up. That's the, that's the, if you bought it at the bottom, congratulations. If you've held from the top, it, so, that 40% bounce doesn't, doesn't feel I don't know quite how, as great. I don't know how much Wayfair fell. Was it 90%? I don't know if it was one of those. But the stock went from 30 to 60 in three weeks. So there's a lot of these. There's a lot of, I think, Ben, that's a good observation. Things that go down so much can go up so much, maybe without some, exp- you know. 92%. You know, I think Wayfair for us has kind of replaced Amazon as the go-to place if we're looking for furniture to buy online first. Do you go to, do you use Wayfair a lot or not? Uh, I do. So my kitchen, you've been in my kitchen. I've got like the island with the bar stools. And we buy relatively cheap ones on Wayfair because they get destroyed. We yes, we you know we throw them out every. Uh, that, that's one two good years. personal finance hack for if you have kids. Never buy expensive furniture; it's a waste of money. It's going to get destroyed. Mm-hmm. Right. And so yeah, I, I am a, I'm a I'm fan. A of, I'm a customer. fan of leather. I'm a fan of leather. For we have a leather couch. The kids just beat the crap out of it, and the leather holds up really, really well. You know, my couch stinks. Get a leather Very, couch. My couch is awful. It's just not comfortable at all. You have to have a good couch. You have to. Uh, but that's the thing. You can't get a, you can't get a cheap couch. No, that's true. But yeah, we, we got a leather one though, and it held up really well. Speaking of home decor, I think my wife was trolling me last night inadvertently. She sent me like somebody did a DIY mudroom. The materials were like <laughs> it was like six hundred bucks. By the way, Ramp was talking to me about this. Hang on, what did he say? He said, uh, "He's like tell him tell me exactly what you paid for." So I told him. <laughs> And he goes, bro, what the f*** did you pay for? Materials in that pick are maybe $1,500 max. You know, someone in the YouTube comments. What am I going to build my own? You don't read the comments, but someone in the YouTube comments last week said, uh, it was a nice surprise to hear you guys talk about the markets on a Mudroom podcast. (laughs) So... All right. I think I'm done with that. All right. Don't worry. I think I'm done. Uh, All right. Jeffrey Patak, Vanguard's U.S. funds and ETFs continue to gather prodigious sums from investors. $83 billion in net inflows in 2022 alone, but growth does appear to be slowing. The fund's 1.1% organic growth rate in 2022 is the slowest since 1999. So, I mean- Do we have to call Jeff out for using prodigious as a word? Is that like granular? Prodigious. I got to be honest. I'm just asking. I don't think I know what that means. I mean, you know, I have decent (laughs) reading comprehension. I could gather from what he's saying, but if you said to me, what does prodigious mean? I would say- a lot. The th- yeah, I don't even know what I would say. Um, so what do you think? Any thoughts about Vanguard? Are they in trouble? A Vanguard's best stays behind them, analyst asks. No, it would have the growth had to fall off eventually. Mm-hmm. Right? There it's it's coming from a much larger position, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Vanguard's still fine. Okay. Uh Warren Pies tweeted the China reopening appears to be realist time. There's data that I think. When he was on TCAF, I think he said he's got a guy that that builds this. I think that's what he said. Um, oh, never mind. <laughs> he looks like he sources somebody else. Data provided by, whoops, I'm sorry. All right, anyway, China flights ramping, now higher than at any point in 2022. It is interesting how quickly, I guess not being a China expert, but how quickly they can just flip the light switch on and off to be like, no, 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 we're shutting down completely to, whoop, open. Right. It happens yeah. very, the stuff with us, it feels like it takes a little longer. I was going to talk about this later, but there was a, there was a, the guy from Moderna was on CNBC last week talking about how they were starting the, the vaccine. They, they pretty much had the vaccine done before they even had the COVID name. Like they, they had a couple cases, Moderna got it. <laughs> they had this name. Duncan you, goes, I mean, Duncan goes, Mike, give us your stock picks for February. Exclamation mark. <laughs> But can you imagine how le- I don't know what would have happened? The p- the pandemic itself was not great. The whole the whole time dealing with it, the waiting. I think what happened was probably about the best case scenario in terms of how that ripped through everything, and then we got the vaccine so quick. Can you imagine if it took like five years to get a vaccine? What would have no. happened? No, it's a great point. How awful! I I don't know. I mean, eventually people would have moved on. There probably would have been some rioting or protest. I don't like, know it, about that. Things would have got really bad. I don't know if people would have moved on. Like if there was no vaccine, there would have been, it just would have been one side, right? Like, I'm sorry, two sides, one line. You're either not moving on or you are moving on. And that would have been ugly. I I just, I I think it, it, there are no counterfactuals. You don't think about it, but the fact that we have just kind of moved on after the vaccine happened, 
and we've put that time past us, it's it's just I don't think people realize how lucky we got. Great point. Okay, here, here's a question from someone. Uh, a professor emailed us. Thought this was a good one for my students. Trying to come up with reasons why 2022 is not a big year for corporate or hedge fund blowups or bankruptcies, notwithstanding the worst year for stocks and bonds since Great Depression. Basically asking, stocks and bonds both got hammered. Why were there no fund blowups last year? Yeah, and I don't know if I have a good. I don't have a good good answer for this. The corporate side of it is easy. I have a good answer. The corporate side of it is easy. Uh, they they were flush with cash going to the going yeah, to corporations. Right, they, they, yeah, go, they, they gorged. Borrowed at lower rates. And yeah. here, here here's another answer. Uh, hedge funds. This is at least equity hedge funds, long short hedge funds. This is a huge overgeneralization, but go with it. They they uh, they buy cheap ish quality and they short expensive. So right. 2022 Value. should have been a good year for that. It, it was a good year. If, if you were doing anything but buying fan mag, the last decade has been brutal. So 2022 is finally like, time for them to shine. I guess you think of a company like Tiger that was down what. 60% or something. Yeah, that that was that not a blow up? I mean, they didn't but go I guess, bankrupt, but. but the thing is they had such a big margin of safety because they had such huge returns leading into that 60% right. decline. So so they maybe that was it. And I, I guess if you look at it, if you think about it, besides crypto, there's not a ton of leverage in the tech space. Right? Like what venture capital is not using leverage. Okay. If something goes to zero, it goes to zero. It's not like there's a cascade of of other problems that are going to domino from that. You could say ARC blew up. In fact, I don't know how else you would describe it. It did blow up. True. But how many hedge funds look like ARC? Zero. Yeah. I, I, it is surprising that just having both of those things not work, that there wasn't some over-leveraged hedge fund that got wrecked. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Out of the economy. I talked about this a little last week. Well, hang on. I'm sorry. One more thing. Tiger's hedge fund, I don't know what's inside of it, but they were down a ton. Probably did kind of look like ARC. Didn't I mention Tiger like two minutes ago? Yeah, no, but, but I'm saying most people think of Tiger. You think about the, well, you were talking about, ex, sir, you you were talking about the private one. I'm talking I about their public they, hedge fund. I'm I talking about their they're, publicly, the public. I thought it was uh, together. Securities. I thought that their public and private is one fund. Uh, I don't think so, but okay, could be wrong. I, that's what they did. I thought that's what all the hedge funds do these days. They have a public markets and then they invest in venture capital. All right. So one of the things that we're, we hear about the economy is that monetary policy works on a lag and Maybe that's why we haven't seen huge problems in the economy yet in the labor market because they raised rates really fast, but now it's been a few months and now we're going to start seeing this. So I, I did this little thing where I looked at Fed funds rate and compared it to the unemployment rate. So when the, the Fed first, it's kind of hard to believe, their first rate hike was in March of 2022. Not that long ago, less than a year ago, and they, how, for how fast that they, they raised rates. The unemployment rate was 3.8% at their first raise. By the time they got to 4.5%, it's 3.5% for the unemployment rate. So as they went from basically 0 to 4.5%, the unemployment rate went down. So we could say monetary policy works in a lag, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, the monetary policy doesn't work like the Fed wants it to or thinks it does. Like, what if that's what we're learning now? Is that, like, hmm. what they think monetary policy does, it doesn't work like they want it to. I think we kind of learned that in the 2010s when they kept interest rates at 0 to try to get inflation to go high, and it didn't. And now maybe it doesn't work the other way either until they get to like, I don't know, 7% or something. Yeah. I mean, there is obviously, listen, it's not like a, a conspiracy to say that higher interest rates at a certain point will wreck demand, right? Like, right. At a, yes. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I think, I think, I think it, it does matter uh, because look at all the, look at all the blowups it caused. Not, you know, in asset prices, not in the real economy. But again, you just asked, does it work on a leg? Yeah, I think it does. But that's I what I mean. Does. Maybe it's more important to asset prices than the actual economy for a while. I think it just it hits asset prices first. Yeah, could be. All right, we got retail sales. Oh, this was man. This seems like a year ago. So we got retail sales on Thursday, and the market fell, and it was up. And PPI came in soft and expected because demand destruction. Well, bad news is bad news again. Well, guess what? Again, back to that narrative vortex. I'm looking at the chart of the S&P 500 candlesticks, of course, so I could actually see what happened. Stocks had a rough day on Thursday. Fell more on Friday, and we're we got it all back. We got it all back. If you look at retail sales, I didn't put this in the doc, but if you pull it on white charts, it is so far above trend from what was happening before the pandemic. Even if it went back down to trend, that would feel like a huge slowdown, even though that would be a, still a rise from what we were in 2019. We spent so much money in this country for like two or three years. So Liz on Saunders tweeted exactly that. Like 
take out 2021, right? Because like 2020 sales went to zero, 21. All right, take that out. Retail sales were up 7.2% in 2022. It's the strongest nominal annual gain since 2004. Now, there are people that are listening that are probably like, you idiot, it's all inflation. All right, fair. But still, it's not as if, it's not as if, uh, I mean, sales were, sales were okay. So what were they down last month? What, was it 1%? Something like that? I think so. But even if you look at real retail sales, which is inflation adjusted, it's starting to roll over because of inflation, but it's still well, well above trend. So it's, it's coming down and inflation is eating into that, but it's much higher than where it was beforehand. That's the thing. It could, just a normalization of that, for some people, it's going to look like a crash, even if it's just getting back onto what we were before. Right. A um, lot of car stuff going on. What, what's going on with this car stuff? So a lot of, a lot of people are saying that like uh, people who are buying cars now are underwater and their loans are so high and their payments are so high. I can see how the payments being high would be a thing, but how many people do you know that are willing to give up their car? What do you like, mean give up their car? I think people would like, isn't everyone who drives a car off the lot underwater on their car loan? Like, doesn't your car depreciate by 20% the minute you drive it off the lot? Okay. So showing people, people are, people just keep saying there's so many people underwater on their car. Loan. Oh, as, as if they're not going to make the payments. Yes, don't you? Th yeah, I no one holds a car right. in the hopes that it's going to rise in value, right, like a right, house. Right. Don't right. you think so, people? So maybe that's like a narrative a car, crime. A car, a car payment is like the last thing you're going to get up on. If you have kids and you need to get them somewhere, yeah, aren't you going to stop paying your gym membership and Netflix and maybe your mortgage before you stop paying your car payment? I feel like yes. car payment is like last in the line of things you give up on. Yeah, it's a narrative crime. I agree with you. Um, before we get to this car stuff, so last week Bullard and Summers, I think on the same day, said the possibility of a soft landing had improved. And then uh, JP Morgan, they, according to the firm's new trade, I'm sorry, according to the firm's trading model, seven of nine asset classes now show less than a 50% chance of a recession. How would asset classes show a chance of recession? Uh, what was it in here? It was credit spreads, stocks, I don't know, things like okay. that. I think maybe asset classes is maybe the wrong word, although I can't remember. Cannot remember. All right, so the, the guy to follow on all this car stuff is Guy Dealership, at Guy Dealership. But he does say subprime consumers are not paying their car loans, Ben, more than ever before. 7.11% of subprime loans were severely delinquent in December, the highest in the data series going back to 2006. So he cited this thing, uh, Cox Auto Inc. did a, like a, uh, they do a weekly market summary. Uh, the loans delinquent by more than 60 days increased by 5.3% and were up 26.7% from a year ago. Of all loans, 1.84% were severely delinquent. Um, I mean, that doesn't sound that bad, does it? Seems That's what I was going to say. How much of subprime is the total? And he also says, also, this is important, delinquencies have not led to defaults yet. Although I guess you would probably expect delinquencies to lead to defaults at a certain point. Uh, he also says... Average monthly payment on a new car hit $777 in December, an all-time record. That's that's nuts. That's very high. I partially blame the environment for cars being at lack of supply, but I also partially blame people spending too much money on SUVs and trucks. I'm going to keep saying it until people listen to me. Every time I go into a parking lot, I, you can't even fit two cars in a parking lot anymore going different directions because the trucks are so big. I'm going to keep. I'm going to harp on this as much as you talk about your mudroom. I almost got into an accident the other day. Funny you should mention, in right? a parking lot. Yes. It's hard I, to get I, through them now. I hesitate to say this out loud, but I have a pristine track record behind the, behind the wheel, not to brag. Knock on wood. I got into one accident in like 2002. Not my fault, in my opinion. Um, my worst I was, one was, I used to drive a Nissan Altima, and I'm driving down the road, and it's kind of icy out, and the guy next to me shimmies a little bit his car, and he sideswipes me I'm just driving straight. Sideswiped me, so I pull over, like, okay, this... And the guy took off. Just took off. Turned to the left light and just ran. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, my first car was a, was a gold Buick Regal. Probably, like, 1997. Not the coolest car in the world, but did the trick. A lot of, a lot of memories in there. Anyway, I was in a parking lot the other day, <laughs> and... I was at the mall there? and I was with Logan. We were going to Dick's Sporting Goods and <laughs> I did something very dumb. I don't know why I did this. Oh, I know why I did this. I put on my right turn, my right signal 
to pull this way into a, <laughs> but I looked at the, the, as soon as I started turning the wheel a little bit, I could tell the space was too tight. So I instead saw a spot in my, out of the left corner of my eye and I wanted to go this way and there was a car incoming, but it was 645 at night. The guy didn't have his lights on. So I feel like technically, even though I would have hit him directly head on, that would have been his fault. Who doesn't have their lights on in a parking lot? Hello? Duncan wants to know that if you Buick Regal is a grandpa car. Pretty sure it is. Grandpa car. Yeah, totally. Definitely. Absolutely. Google it. So we talked last week about the Tesla price cuts, and the Wall Street Journal had a story saying that it's kind of messing with the market. So they, they lowered their prices enough so some of their models could hit that $7,500 tax credit. I think above a certain price point, you can't get the tax credit anymore. So they not only lower their prices, but people could also, if you if you are under a certain income level, you're, you qualify for a $7,500 tax credit, which is, which is great. And they're saying all these other car companies that have been jacking up their prices are now thinking, what do we have to lower them to? I think this is a great thing. So the, the Bank of America analyst was talking about Tesla saying, they don't know if this is a good thing that Tesla's doing this because they're trying to stoke demand or it's a bad thing saying that their prices are too high. But isn't this the kind of thing where one, one company does it, the other ones have to do it a little bit? I hope so. And hopefully we get some other price cuts coming for the cars. I mean, the, the, the prices are ludicrous. So I, I told you I've been texting with my car broker, just putting out feelers, seeing what the market is like. It is absurd. Still feels like now is not the time to buy a car. I still feel like you, if you can, you wait. Right? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm not, I can't do it. I just can't I think do we got to wait for more supply. I think more supply still has to come online. Yeah, I can't do it. doesn't make sense. Uh, oh, how about this? Here's some good news from Stephen Ratner. Chart showing that the average deposit held by the bottom half of American households more than tripled from 2019 to 2022. Does that mean we can finally get rid of that stupid stat that seven out of 10 Americans can't come up with $400 to, for an emergency? Now it's now, Whatever well, it is. no, now the stat is seven out of 10 can't come up with an inflation adjusted $400 for an emergency. All right. Another good piece. This is from Bloomberg. More than 5 million businesses were created in the U.S. last year. A sign that entrepreneurship boom spawned by the pandemic may be long lasting. Uh, new business applications rose by 44% from 2019 to 2022. Sharpest increases was in Southern states. So that's uh, that's the good news. The bad news is three million of them were on the blockchain. But isn't this doesn't this fly in the face of no one wants to work anymore? Quiet quitting. Everyone is lazy. We're creating new businesses at a record pace. I kind of feel like a lot of that was probably bullshit. I and mean, there's 14, probably fourteen thousand businesses there. were created every day in twenty twenty two. Well, but there's a big difference between creating a job versus lazy employees, or, or I should say lazy, bad employees, employees that don't want to work. Those are two very different people. I'm sorry. Grog, go. back, back in the Stone Age, was a lazy huh? worker. Every, Grog. I'm saying- Grog? Isn't that the name of like a Stone, Stone Age man? Like a, you know, I'm saying throughout history, there's always been lazy workers. Mm -hmm. There's never been a time when everyone was all of a sudden like, I love my job. Yes. I'm going to do the best I can. There's yes. always been lazy workers. Yes. It's not like maybe, maybe we just we, maybe we just know it now because people post their shitty jobs on social media. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about layoffs. Uh, they're coming. Uh, this is a big week for layoffs. Paul Kodrowski tweeted, not a fan of the guy who owns this place. Talking about Elon, but it is worth pointing out that despite having lost 80% of its employees and being down to 550 or so engineers, it is still mostly running. If you think buyout firms like Thomas Bravo aren't noticing... You don't know your capitalism. Then Alex Kantrowitz tweeted, not to him directly, but the meme that Elon cut 75% of Twitter and the service works just fine is a bit off. Many of those cuts were in the sales org and revenue is down 40%. That's not working fine. Now, I feel like I feel like the revenue being down is, is more of an indictment on people just boycotting Elon than the service being shitty. Or maybe it's, maybe it's a combination of both. But the service is definitely glitchy now. But I mean, but for the most part, it does work. I mean, it works. Yes, people keep saying that they're getting shadow banned and not seeing certain accounts. I guess I haven't noticed any difference. I've not I've noticed, noticed some things here. The, all right, we don't need to complain about Twitter. Um, Alex Morris tweeted a chart. Amazon, yes, Google. You, you complain about Twitter on Twitter. Right, exactly. That's the platform well, yeah, for complaining yeah, about Twitter. Yeah. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Meta. So, so tech layoffs are coming in hot and heavy. 2016 cumulative headcount, 545,000. 2021 cumulative headcount, 2 million. I think one of the things that was so special about these tech companies early on 
was just the insane amount of leverage they had in the system in terms of revenue per employee, uh, income per employee, all that sort of stuff. And I don't know what happened, but it turned out that like, I guess growth and headcount growth was became in vogue. Like well, it went from is, this like, is from the Wall Street Journal. This is why I think tech layoffs tell us absolutely nothing about the economy right now. I don't think you can learn anything from these tech layoffs. From fiscal year end in 2019, September 2019 to September 2022, Apple's workforce grew about 20%. 164,000 people they added. Over the same period, employee count at Amazon doubled. Microsoft rose 53%. Google's rose 57%. And Facebook rose 94%. So if you're seeing these numbers and thinking they're big, just think about how many employees were added in that three-year period. Right. And so this is just, we they overdid it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was because of competition with one another or they thought things were going to be rosy forever and they're making so much money. The reason that they are letting so many people go is because they overhired, plain and simple. This has nothing to do with the economy. So Google laid off 6.4% of their employees. That's 12,000 people. Guess what? And I don't mean this, uh, I'm not happy they're doing it, but that's a professional layoff. 6.4%, right? Sure, it wasn't a 10%. Uh, so it says Google Brain, the art of, this is from the information, the AI lab that has helped Google's core business use machine learning software to personalize products to improve in tar ad targeting was relatively uninfected. That unit is now urgently trying to work with product groups on how to de develop new services powered by human machine learning, blah, 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 um, in response to OpenAI, ChatGPT, and Microsoft. Okay, you know, somebody tweet, you ever have, you ever have, you ever see something that is so obvious that you're like, you you sort of wonder how you didn't think of it yourself. But like you like if, if somebody asks you, here's where I'm going with this. Somebody tweeted, I can't remember who, that Gmail the G, the Google box the Gmail inbox is just a disaster, or something along the lines. And I realized I was like, hey yeah, it is a disaster. But it was a weird disconnect. Like I, do you know where I'm going with this? Like you, you wish you would have thought that you would have had that idea. Yes. Like it's such an obvious thing to say, but you don't really, you don't like think it out loud. It's just sort of, uh, in your subconscious until you see it on screen. All right. Anyway, the Google inbox sucks. I search for stuff all the time and I can't find anything ever. The search is tough. I don't, I don't mind the inbox itself, but you're right. The search, if you no, need to I'm find the inbox, tough. I can't find anything I'm looking for old conversations. I just, it's, it's one of 475, like the, the, the targeting on the word, it's terrible. You know, actually, what, what is a good one for search is Slack. Slack is pretty good about Slack finding little phenomenal. conversations. I find right? everything in two seconds. Because yeah. you could with Slack, you could search, is it a, uh, who's it coming from? Which chat? Is it a file? Like, yeah, Slack is phenomenal. Uh, so Google New York City employees who arrived at the office early this morning stood in a line to test their badges. If light turned red, it meant you had been laid off. If green, you were safe. That sounds pretty cold. By the way, the stock was up 5.4% of the day. All these stocks, the best way to – these stocks, you announce layoffs and the stocks – that kind of sounds like a Squid Game kind of. That sounds like the beginning of season two of Squid Game. You get the red thing, you go down to the subway, the guy hands you the card, you're on Squid Game season two. When is Squid 2 coming out? I don't care. I'm I don't not, I think I'm out. Uh, really? But anyway, somebody, a Google, somebody okay. from Google commented, we have, we, I know this like seems cold, but we have, we have 30,000 managers. It's too big, right? 30,000 managers. So there wasn't like a, I'm not saying there so was something a, probably, something probably slipped through the cracks. This wasn't, they didn't do this on purpose. No, yes, they did. I think they did. But I'm saying they're like, not that there's not a more humane way to do this, but I don't, yeah, it was not an accident. Uh, Microsoft to ax thousands of jobs. Con, uh, was it 5% of their workforce? Yeah, let's try to Microsoft employees. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Huge. Yeah, so they, um, they all overhired. So Microsoft, is taking a $1.2 billion impairment charge and soon to be announced earnings related severance costs. Think about how big that is. 1.2 billion in severance costs. There was, a, there was an article uh, about like why Apple hasn't done it yet. And I can't remember exactly. Oh, here's an interesting stat. Apple has 65,000 retail employees. That so makes they need 40, those people. They need those people. That makes up 40% of the company's workforce. Apple hasn't done a big round of layoffs since 1997. That is the kind of place where I don't go to the mall very often. I don't frequent the mall as much as it's you the do. It's the only store that's packed. Like, no, I never go to the mall. Always, never go to the mall. You call me like once every six months and say, hey, I'm looking no. for some new clothes. What should I get? <laughs> 12. Once every 12 months. <laughs> All right. Uh, Spotify. I, do I always come through for you with the, the new fashion trends? You do, except every time you tell me to buy something, it's like a $180 shirt. Yeah, cause I don't know what places you're shopping at. but uh, yeah. All right, Spotify. What did they announce? How many was it? 
Oh, 6% of its workforce. Is 6% the new 10%? I feel like 6% is legit. As long as it's a it's a even number. Like you said, 6.4 for Google or whatever. If it's a flat number, there's more coming. Bob Elliott tweeted, tech layoffs are getting a lot of press, but these layoffs are small, being quickly absorbed into a tight labor market. Who else? Oh, Wayfair. Okay, Wayfair, cutting 10% of its staff, 1,750 people. I'm sorry, that's not the first, that's not, that won't be the last cut. You see these headlines and this is why you say, see, we're already in a recession. All these people are getting laid off. In the past, you never saw layoff announcements like you do on social media now. If these that's things happened, you didn't, you didn't really hear about them that much. That's true. Uh, and the stock, the stock had a. I can't remember what the number is. I think Mark Andreessen wrote this one time. It's something like every single year, five to six million jobs are lost, and five to six million jobs are created. That's just like mm -hmm. the dynamism of the U.S. economy. That's whether recession or we're growing, right? Like that, that kind of thing happens all the time, anyway. We've said this a million times. All the high, pro the, all the lefts are happy at the most high-profile companies in the country. So maybe it feels worse than it is, or maybe not. Um, what else? There's one more thing in here. Uh. Was it? Oh, uh, someone from Goldman Sachs just sent me this message. The entire institutional sales floor was laid off yesterday. The music is, a st is about to stop. Be ready. Somebody, so here's a message. I work in institutional sales at Goldman Sachs. Entire floor laid off today. Partner held a meeting saying that the, quote, music was about to stop. Please keep anonymous. Is Maybe they should have cut off the message at please keep anonymous. Right? Instead of posting it on Twitter. Is there is there a read through to the economy about about uh, investment banking cutting? Like Goldman did terrible with their with their uh, push into the consumer banking, right? Isn't part of it also like there's been no IPOs? There's been no IPOs. There was an awful flop. Though. There, there was there was no uh, underwriting activity last year. So does this say more about the global economy? Is the music about to stop because Goldman is cutting back? I don't I don't necessarily think so. I mean, do this you? is also the thing. If if you work in the loan department at a bank and you're doing zero refinancing now and you were you were going bananas with refinancing for three or four years straight and half of your department gets la laid off, you're probably thinking there's a depression coming, right? So a lot yeah. of this is targeted at specific industries, unfortunately. So if you're in one of those and you were unlucky enough to be there, it doesn't it doesn't matter what the economy is doing to you. It feels like a recession. Yes. And it is because you lost your I, job. I have a, a take on all of those people getting cut, which we'll revisit in a second when we get to real estate. But before we do, so tech's percentage of S&P 500 market cap went was as high as 30% at the peak, and it's now down to 21. That's a, that's a that's a gigantic drop. That is gigantic. In that quick of time, yes. Wow. Slumdog Billionaire. That's not bad. What's that? The chart's called Slumdog Billionaire. Not bad. Uh, Ram tweeted a chart from uh, Indeed via the journal. Job postings on Indeed.com changed from a year earlier. How about you this? I remember when I was looking for jobs back in like the mid 2000s and even then the career dot com, like career builder or whatever they were back. I can't remember what they were called. The monster.com, the mm -hmm. job sites, they were mm -hmm. all worthless back then. There's no way that these things can be helpful for anyone. If you're able to send out your resume to from all over the country to the, like, there's no way that these sites are helpful anymore. Right. Uh, for finding wrong. a job wrong. LinkedIn is like one of the okay, biggest I'm saying, I'm saying LinkedIn, that's different, but for some of these other places, just just going to whatever, I don't know what the website is people use these days to find a job. There's no way that's helpful to people. Where do you think people find jobs? LinkedIn. I'm saying like these, these ones where you just post your resume, getting through because now that people can work remotely, there's got to be 10 times more resumes coming to these people. I'm just saying it's got to be very hard to get yours through the, for someone to actually look at. Well, we don't need to talk about what my resume looked like. You know what I had in my resume? I had Cabana Boy in my resume. I had Waiter. <laughs> and you wrote about the Cavs versus the Magic. You changed proficient your mind. Proficient in, I don't even think I had proficient in anything. I don't think I had that in my resume. My resume was a, was a disaster. All right, um, let's talk about crypto for a second. So Bitcoin is now at 23,000, by the way. It's Tuesday, 11.15 a.m. Uh Bitcoin was 20,000 when FTX news came out. Isn't that kind of wild? What were the lows? 15? The low was 15.5. I still can't believe it didn't go below there. Does that Same. does that show that like the the people who are the biggest holders are are literally never going to sell? Are they the ones that are the whales that control the most of the Bitcoin? Can they control the price that much where they No, 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 it's the opposite. It's the opposite. 
you take them out of the equation. All that okay, happens is that, is that the prices. Right? Yeah, all that happens is that the float shrinks. So it really but it is the margin. So but it would take one of them to sell towards the bottom to really see this thing plunge. Yeah, yeah, I think, I guess, I think so. So it really is the marginal buyer and seller. And uh, guess what? More buyers and sellers. I guess so. It, it, the the longer Bitcoin goes without dying, that's that's the bull case for me. That's like the one remaining bull case is this thing will not die despite all the bad stuff that happens in crypto. All right, there was an article in ETF.com about untangling the web that is DCG, which uh, owns Genesis, which I believe filed for bankruptcy. All right, so here's, here's the story. I'm so confused. There's Genesis and GBTC and DCG, and it's all very confusing. Well, it's all, it's all DCG is a parent company. DCG owns Coindesk. It owns Genesis. And it owns uh, Grayscale and some mining companies. So it's like, I don't know if it's the biggest company in crypto, but it certainly is a, an extremely important player. All right, so the deal is that Genesis owes its largest 50 creditors $3.5 billion. Genesis got a hole blown it when Terra Luna blew up and then Three Hours Capital blew up and they were lending money to Three Hours Capital and did not get paid back. So DCG owns 67 million shares of GBTC, which is around a 10th of all shares outstanding. At current market prices, those are worth around 800 million throwing another $100 million worth of shares for the, the Ethereum trust, E-T-H-E. So they're saying like, why not just sell to like sort of uh, make make them whole? Well, one is that- regu- Could they from- sell at NAV if they wanted? Does it yeah, look like, like that or not? Pr- transaction? I don't, I don't yeah. know. Okay. Who would, but who would, who, why would anybody buy That's it? That's true. When you could buy it at a 50, 40% discount. Uh, right? So ETF.com says, uh, one is that regulations prevented from selling more than 1% of GBTC's shares outstanding per quarter. So at that pace, even if they wanted to unwind, it would take two and a half years. Okay. Secondly, if they were to do that, the discount would widen even further. So they're not going to dump this onto the market. This is not going to. And even less like the option is for DCG to order Grayscale to liquidate. Um, but with $13.3 billion in AUM and a 2% management fee, that's $266 million in annual revenue. So that's not happening either. But then I saw a tweet from this person at North Rock LP. Genesis filing reveals that $31 million of GBTC was already sold by Genesis in the last few months. This actually ex- might explain why the spreads widen so aggressively and clears a large overhang from the future. So GBTC is actually outperforming Bitcoin by a, by a decent amount this year. The premium, uh, the discount was almost negative 50%. Now it's like negative 40. So I pulled this as of last Friday. GBTC was up 47% on the year, while Bitcoin was up 27%. One more thing here. But it's obviously underperformed for a long time before. Oh, yeah. Because of the, yeah. over the uh, last five things. years, over the last five years, Bitcoin is up 100% over the last five years. What do you think GBT's performance is? GB, I can't even say it. GBTC's performance is, as Bitcoin so, has doubled. Bitcoin, over the last five years, that's it? Five years, Bitcoin is up 100%. I guess that's what happens when you lose uh, 70 plus percent. Yes. Uh, I bet if you zoom back six years, zoom out, Ben, zoom out. Yeah. Uh, well, five years kidding. is about the, the last peak almost, so um, that's why. Okay, got it. So, uh, uh, I don't know, what, uh, 30%? It's down 34%. Whoa. Can you imagine holding that five years and you're underperforming about 130% of the asset you're supposed to track because there's a discount? That's rough. That's so tough. also involved in this is Gemini, who their earned product was funneled through Genesis. We've been through this. Gem- Gemini loans to Genesis. Genesis loans to people that apparently didn't pay them back. Now people that had money in Gemini. This is why I'm get- so confused. Gemini, Genesis, GBTC, DC. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot. So, uh, all right. So Gemini earned customers are owed $900 million. That's a lot of money. And that's just awful. $900 million on the platform that's stuck. So- the person that I've been following for this is uh, AP underscore Abacus on, on Twitter. So update, per Genesis bankruptcy filing, Gemini has $600 million available pledged via GBTC shares value to return to, to Gemini earned customers. Uh, 31 million shares have already been delivered and another 31 million have been pledged. So it looks like there's a 300 or so million dollar difference. So if that's the case, that's actually decent news. We've got a bunch of questions from people who say, I have my crypto or whatever stuck on platform X, name five different platforms. Can I write that off for my tax purposes? Like, I don't think I'm ever going to get uh, it back. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe I have no idea. Could. Let's say, no let's idea. say you had 10 grand in, in Bitcoin on FTX. 
that money is gone. Do you write that off as a loss in your taxes? I don't know. I mean, ask your accountant. Uh, so there was co- there was a uh, talk that DCG would sell CoinDesk. I think they were looking at like they were looking to get two hundred million dollars. This guy again, AP underscore Abacus says initial con- con- uh, conversations for CoinDesk range from fifteen to twenty five million dollars. Who knows if that's true or not? But well, how much money could it be making right now if there's no crypto companies that are able to to advertise? Right. I don't know. I think they're the biggest. So two hundred million for a crypto. Media company right now? Are you kidding me? I'm not me? buying it. I, know, I, I hope no one's buying it for that. All right, so let's talk about real estate. Um, so there, there were a lot of layoffs in the mortgage departments of these banks. When I refinanced in 2021, I guess, it took forever. Why? Your, your mic, you, 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 you're, you're muted. Stop. This is what happens when you tap your mic. You don't need to move your mic. You don't need to move your mic. No, I muted my mic because I'm, I've am been sick for a week and I'm clearing my throat and I don't want people to hear me clear my throat. Oh, that was a deliberate mute? Was it, I did it on purpose. Oh, very nice. But I'm saying you complaining about your, us complaining about our mortgage refinancing in 2021 was to 2023 as you complaining about your mudroom. Well, I'm not complaining. I didn't complain. Just stating the facts. Did I complain? I, I, I might've complained. But anyway, so what happens if... Mortgage rates continue to pull back, which they have. Activity shoots up, which it has. And uh, there's not enough people to service these, these mortgages. Then what? I think- Is it deja fall- vu all over again? But it's fallen so far, the activity. I don't know. Don't you think that- I think even if you see a big increase in activity, it's still going to be way below levels that we had in the past. But you know, like all these tech companies overhired- what if the mortgage companies, what if they overfired? True. So it, people are just going to have to wait again for their paperwork. Causes probably. another logjam. All right. So I saw this tweet this morning. Goldman calling a housing bottom already. We believe that the aggregate drag on GDP growth from the housing sector peaked in, in, Q2, in Q4 2022. The negative impulse of home sales is diminishing and leading indicators of home sales have already turned higher. So the third year was, was almost at 6%. Maybe that explains the housing stocks going bananas. Can you imagine thinking that like, this is it, this is the housing crash I've been waiting for. And then it doesn't really happen. Like we get like a five or 10% pullback. Well, it's in your way, way, it's way too early to say that it's over, yes. but I think we've been talking about this. That, like, but it, it's all based on, right. So Bill McBride tweeted that it got down to 6% yesterday. This is, this is interesting from market watch. So they, they had a story about home builders who, instead of lowering prices, cause home builders don't want to lower prices right now, because here's the problem. If you have, 30 people who are in co- under contract for a home, and mm-hmm. then you say we're lowering prices by $30,000 for a home, all those people under contract are going to go, screw you. Get, uh, you can keep my deposit. I'm going to get a new one at a lower price point. And so what they're doing instead is instead of lowering prices, they're lowering mor- they're buying down the mortgage rate. So they said in California, Pacific Point Communities is offering mortgage rates as low as 2.75%. Pulte Homes in Texas is offering them for 4.25%. And uh, K have... How do you say that? Havanian is Wait, offering at 4.9%. I don't understand. I don't understand. So here's, These... he, here's what's happening. The mortgages, so it's, it's here, it's in this article. It says, put simply, some builders are eating the difference between prevailing mortgage rates and what the consumer will accept just to get inventory moving and empty homes off their back. You know how you can pay down for a mortgage rate at the bank? You can pay points. The, the home builders are paying those to the banks saying, we're going to pay down a rate from 6% to 4.5%. And, and in, so instead of lowering prices by that much, we're going to pay for the mortgage to come down that much. So the home builders can't do huge price cuts. So they're, instead of cutting the prices, they're cutting the mortgage rates and they're paying for the mortgage rate points to come down. Cause if you put a bigger down payment down, you could pay down your mortgage points if you wanted to, to pay down to a lower rate. That's what the builders are doing. And that could potentially, I mean, that can't last forever, but after they get their backlog of houses in, that could potentially for a while put something of a floor under housing prices if they're not yeah. willing to lower prices. I saw a chart that shows 96% of outstanding mortgages have interest rates below PMMS. We're looking at the distribution of outstanding 30 year mortgages and just eyeballing, it looks like almost all of them are, are well below five. What's PMMS? Prime I got mortgage, nothing. market, <laughs> salary, soup. Sure. I don't know. But yeah, but I think that's the, the thing with the home builders because rates change so quickly. That's why it's easier for them to pay down rates 
and as opposed to cutting prices, which put it's a weird dynamic. Okay, we hear we heard from a bunch of people in different housing markets. But wait, right? less, less, I'm sorry, this? less lessing, lessing. But look at the, look at this chart of MBA U.S. Mortgage uh, Index weekly percent change. So what you saw a huge spike in applications, highest spike since since uh, pandemic. So, so rates, rates came back seven down. Seven to six, and people and activity, decided to get back in. Yeah. All right. So what's the situation with Australia? We got a lot of. Apparently, we've got a big Aussie audience. So. Uh, they so they say listening. thirty year fixed rate mortgage isn't an option there. At best, you can lock in for five years, but generally pretty expensive to do so. Additional one to two percent. So at the best, people would lock in rates for one to three years. Most people are floating or rolling off of their fixed rate. That's tough. One to three years. That's a lot of change, right? So it says if you bought two or three years ago and rates were near zero, uh, you may have a two and a half percent variable rate mortgage. If rates keep going, that could easily get up to five or six percent in a few years, and your mortgage repayments suddenly shoot up. Could force some people to sell. That's painful. I'm glad we do not have to do that. Not good. All right. Just a few plugs for quarter. You could sign up for a weekly recap. I obviously don't expect anybody or most 99% of you to ever listen to a conference call. But if you are interested in staying on top of the stuff and you want to just see like a weekly recap, they provide that so we can link to that in the show notes. All right. Sam Rowe tweeted, with 11% of S&P 500 companies having reported, 57% are beating earnings, which might sound good, but it's actually well below the 70% average. Uh, and 61% are beating on revenues, which is lower than the 69%. Average. That's that's, that's that's so funny that seventy percent of the time they beat estimates, showing that the estimates are just a crock, basically. Yeah. Um, but that's so that's not good. Uh, listen, it's only eleven percent, so definitely early. Who do we have coming up this week? Do we have Microsoft? I think that most of the tech giants are are next week. All right, let's start with Netflix. Alex Morris has a, a wonderful Substack showing the. We're going through some charts. So I'm, I'll talk through it. Global paid streaming subs had plateaued for one, I don't know, like five quarters and accelerated. So they added 7 million. I think they were expected to add four. So that was a great beat. The, the annual Netflix cycle over the last four years has been, they're the top dog. There's way too much competition. Now they're the top dog again. That was, that happened very quickly. Their annual revenues are now up to $31 billion. Guess how big that is. We've said a million times that Netflix is a king. Even though we'll talk about if HBO you stacked later. one dollar bills, it would go to the moon. Is that yeah. what you're gonna tell me? <laughs> no, we'll talk about HBO later. HBO is that is, is, the, that, is that the most worthless stat you've ever heard? Apple stop, makes so much yeah. money that if you stacked them in one dollar bills, it would go around the earth twelve times. I used that line in my book. Listen, yeah, no, but back was, back then it was, it was legit. Ago. It was yeah. legit. Uh, HBO are the Eagles, and maybe this is too disparaging to Netflix. I want to say Netflix is the Giants, but what I'm trying to say is there's a huge gap in quality the last of like just the quality by the way let's just say saturday night sucked uh but proud of my boys it was uh we we outperformed with a really lousy roster i was shocked the degree to which their offensive line dominated not necessarily on the defensive side i expected to get beat up a little bit but it was just not a fair fight just you didn't uh, expect to be there anyway so you you were playing with house no, it, was, it, was, it was all good i wish it wasn't the eagles because i hate the <laughs> eagles man but such is life. All right. Um, so $31.6 billion. That is equal to the combined run rate of Disney plus Warner Brothers and Paramount. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, all right. This is from uh, uh, this is from the earnings report. They said, as it's become clear that streaming is the future of entertainment, our competitors, including media companies and tech players, are investing billions of dollars to scale their new services, but it's hard to build a large and profitable streaming business. Our best estimate is that all of these competitors are losing money on streaming with aggregate annual direct operating losses this year alone that could be well in excess of $10 billion compared with our $5 to $6 billion of annual, annual operating profit. For incumbent entertainment companies, this high-level investment is understandable given the accelerating decline of linear TV, which currently generates the bulk of their profit. That's so, why, because of all the debt these companies have taken on and losing so much money, that's why there has to be consolidation, right? Yeah. Some of, Peacock and Paramount Plus and Hulu, all, like all, eventually some of these have to come together. Oh, I found out that I, have, that I pay for Peacock, which is news to me. I saw my wife watching something. I was like, what is this? She said Peacock. Phil Huber told me- We, we have Peacock. Phil Huber told me that the entire uh, WWE catalog is on Peacock. So maybe I'll watch the uh, the ladder match from Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. 
I haven't oh. seen that one in a while. 1994, Ben would be very 94. excited about that. 2003, I think it was Ben, not so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, last thing. Uh, this is from Ben Thompson. He's talking about the debt. Is this Netflix that has $14 billion in debt? I think that's what it is. Warner Brothers Discovery, meanwhile, has $50 billion in debt. Disney has $45 billion in debt. Paramount has $15.6 billion. Comcast, the owner of PPAC, has $90 billion in debt. None of them, in contrast to Netflix, are making money on streaming. Uh, so how about that? So there will when, when, when do we see consolidation? Too early? Netflix is in the driver's seat again. It's Yeah, maybe in the recession. I don't know. If we ever uh, have what else we oh we heard from uh, the the CEO of Verizon this morning was on was on CNBC I just saw a tweet go by customers are paying delinquencies are low uh, consumers waited longer during the holiday season but they but they came just days before Christmas and did a deal I feel like that's where you see delinquencies Cell phones? phones yeah isn't a phone kind of like you have to have one now though yeah yeah maybe mm. well actually how about this how about this. Absolutely. But that's, that's the point, Ben. Everybody has a cell phone and you're going to be late to pay if you're having financial troubles. It doesn't mean that you're going to default and you're going to stop paying, but you would see delinquencies in cell phones because everyone has one, even the lowest end consumer. Okay. I don't mean that. I don't mean that in, uh, in, I don't mean that in an insensitive way, but just lowest income. Even people who have Android phones and not iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Schwab. I don't need to talk about Schwab. It's kind of boring. Um, I put Ally Financial in here. Why? They're like one of, the, I think they're the biggest digital bank in the country. I didn't realize how big they were. Uh, they have this chart on the used vehicle outlook. So they're expecting, because they're a huge auto lender, they're expecting values to be down 13% in 2023. For used car prices. Which would be a 30% decline since the 2021 peak. That that's makes pretty, sense. That's, it's pretty healthy. No? Yeah. I'm, but if you, look at their, if you look at their projected, not projected, I'm sorry, their actual retail auto net charge-offs on delinquencies, they're certainly on the rise, but these are not big numbers just yet. You're more worried about the car market than I am. Fair? All right. You put this- I, Yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking. I don't know if I have, know enough to have an opinion. I'm just going to be following this guy and see what he says. Okay. <laughs> that's what it's for. You put the average U.S. commercial credit card interest rate, it shot up to like 19%, and it shot up immediately. How do you feel about this? I have an offsetting. So the Wall Street Journal today had an article about how people are finally moving out of their crappy savings accounts. The average savings account, according to FDIC, for banks is 0.33%, which the fact that you can raise credit cards this high this fast and keep your savings rate at 30 basis points when gross. the Fed funds rate is 4.5% is ridiculous. There should be some sort of there should if you're going to raise borrowing rates, you should have to raise savings rates as well. There should be some sort of linkage there. I'm surprised that Elizabeth Warren isn't finding out about this. At least maybe she is, and I don't know about it. Right. But with all the nonsensical arguments, who's that guy that goes after corporations? Was talking about. I saw a really bad tweet this week. A really bad take. No, not is on it Twitter. Robert Reich? Is that the guy's name? Yeah. Did you see what he he, he had something this week that was particularly nonsensical? All right, so this guy, Robert Reich, tweeted, uh, egg prices are up 60%. That's absurd. People are paying upwards of 6 and $7 for dozen eggs. Why? Corporate greed. The largest egg producer, CalMain, is raking, in, raking record... Pro okay, stop it. Stop it right now. Everybody knows this is nonsensical. We know it's not corporate greed. Uh, how many hens have died? It's, uh, it's, it's bird flu. It's, so just stop it. Anyway, this guy and others who, who make silly arguments about corporations, go after the banks about yes. this. Exactly. This, is a worthy, this is a worthy hill to fight, to fight on. Here, here. I've been on this one for years. No one's listening to me. So I, I don't, we don't spend a lot of time here, but this is a great example, a great example of gradual improvements going unnoticed, which is a blog post that I've written about that I believe I stole from Bill Gates. Uh, so Derek good, Thompson, good news is not in the headlines because it's, it's not a... It's not a one-day thing. It's a process. Right, exactly. Not it's not an event. event. So Derek Thompson tweeted, new report, U.S. cancer mortality rate fell by one-third in the past three decades. Mortality declines are accelerating for lung cancer. Oh, that's not good. Slowing for breast cancer, stabilizing for prostate cancer. But again, U.S. cancer mortality rates fell by one-third in the past three decades. This should be the front of every newspaper and every media outlet for weeks and uh, probably won't see a mention of it. 
Because who's clicking on this? Not exactly, uh, you know. Your weekly dose that's of optimism works. from us. Right? That's the way it works. Ben, can I tell you, can I tell you while we're on the, just tangents, a, a quick story that paints me in, I don't know, the, the listeners can decide if this makes me look like a good person or a jerky person or somewhere in between. I'll be the judge for that. Okay, fair. Although I, I did give you a heads up about this, but here's the story. So I, I, so we went to dinner uh, with, with Phil. I went to dinner with Phil after TCAF. Phil, Doug, and a friend of mine. And we went to a steakhouse, uh, like a French steakhouse. And here's my line on steak. What's your favorite steak? Well, I've said this a million times. To me, I, I love steak and I've never had a bad steak in my entire life. I really, in order to like give like a favorite, I really would love to do a taste test, which will never, ever, ever happen because you're not going to put all these different steaks, you know, on a plate next to each other. So I have some that are like better than others. There's a lot but, of good steaks. Yeah, I've never had a bad steak. It's like, like pizza. literally, I've never had a bad steak. Well, I've had bad pizza. Had Domino's the other week. Terrible. I've had bad pizza. I mean, I've, I've, I've never had bad steak. So we got a tomahawk ribeye. And it's expensive, right? It's not a cheap piece of meat. And it was objectively bad. Like it, it, it just, we got it medium rare and it wasn't even necessarily overcooked, but it was just, it, it was really tough and really fatty and just not good. And I was, wasn't was going to say anything, but I said to the guys, I was like, I not to be a bummer. Like this, this isn't good steak, right? Like this is not good. Again, I'm not like a food snob. Like I don't have like a fine palate. I like steak. This stunk. So we were in the up, we were in the, on the upstairs level. So I was waiting um, on the steps for the waiter to to just tell him, and I wasn't even necessarily asking for anything. Listen, would it have been nice if he took it off the stake, uh, off the check? Yeah, it would have been nice. But I just wanted to let them know, hey, this was just, you know, I'm I'm doing it for the people. I want to make sure the people behind me get the bad steak. That's not true. I'm just kidding. Um, but so I'm waiting on the steps, and the waiter's not coming down. So one of the, the assistant manager comes over to me. And says, uh, is everything okay, sir? And I said, I'm just waiting for the, just waiting for the waiter. Waiter didn't come down. So I said, you know what? Let me just talk to you while I have you. Uh, we got a time walk ribeye and it, it was not good. Like it just, it wasn't great. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll take that right off the bill. I was like, great. Thank you. Another manager came over to the table. Now I go back to the table and I didn't tell them I said anything. Cause I'm not trying to like, I didn't want to do it at the table. I never, I would never send food back. I've never sent food back in my life. You ever thought? <laughs> I'm just thinking back to like four weeks ago when you said, I never say anything to the manager. And now that's two instances in a month that you've done this. I'm just okay, well, putting it that's out why, there. That's why I'm bringing this I'm up. pointing it out there. The last time I was in the right, 100% on the right, I ordered Casamigos to give Clase Azul. Stop. That's, 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 that's inappropriate. Although in that sense, I shouldn't have even paid for it. I should have said, I don't want to pay for this. I did pay for it. All right. So the manager comes over to the table. Now, mind you, I have not told the guys anything. I'm sitting next to Phil Huber. Phil is from Chicago. He's Midwest, not Midwest nice. Doug is not that nice. I love Doug, but you know, he's not afraid to say something. So the magic comes over. Is everything okay? And, uh, Phil's like, Oh, everything's great. Phil's about to be like, Oh, best meal I've ever had. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm like, yeah, shut up. So, uh, so the, she goes, what about the steak? And immediately Doug's flip switched. Doug knew that I went and said something. So Doug had my back. Doug's like, you know what? Gotta be honest with you. The steak was fatty. It wasn't good. It was overcooked. You know what they did for us? They gave us a free dessert. Okay. That's okay. Fair. I don't not know. Okay. <laughs> what do you want? To, I don't know. <laughs> they should have given you a gift certificate. Not not okay. So yeah, listen, I, I'm not I'm not a send it backer. I'm not a I won't pay for this. Is that Just, is that also a you get a worse tip for this? No, I didn't do that. It's not of the waiter. But here's the thing. Okay. I That's was true. I was in the hospital. I sh I should have mentioned I was in the hospitality business. I was waiting for, for four years. What do I do in that scenario? That comes right off the bill. Yeah. I wasn't That's looking fair. to, I'm not looking to abuse the system. Here, have a piece. Stunk. All right. Sorry. That story was way too long. Um, and probably not even that good. Uh, I think you right. just want, you just wanted to tell people that you really are a Karen and you go to complain to the management. That's twice now in a month. <laughs> not in a month. We were in I can't, Houston. I can't go anywhere with you anymore. Uh, okay. So streaming took over a thousand basis points of share over the past year. Of what, From TV? Alex Morris via, via Nielsen. So it looks like it's slowing down, but like... A thousand basis points or 10%? Wow. Yeah. Well, whatever. You know what I mean. Same, it, same thing. That's crazy. It went from 28% to 38%. I feel like we may not this be is like, this is like This is like the ETF mutual fund thing. It's inevitable. True. How about this? This is like the one outlier outperformer. 
don't think we're making a big enough deal about the fact that a, a sequel for Avatar made $2 billion. Oh, non- I saw some- Marvel. Somebody tweet that Jim Cameron, do I call him James or Jim? What do we call him? Jim? Jim. He has three of the yeah. six highest grossing movies of all time. And the only That's director wild. with three films across $2 billion. That's wild. And, oh, I bought Disney stock. You're a Disney holder, okay. I did. I bought Disney last week. Welcome to the um, club. Disney owns 21st Century Fox, which uh, produced Avatar. That's true. It's going to be on it. The first one's on there. My son keeps asking, when is number two going to be on Disney Plus? He loved the first one. Great. All right, recommendations. Right. What do you got? 1923. They had the first four episodes up at Paramount Plus. The I think it starts up again in a couple of weeks. I don't know if they're waiting for the Super Bowl to be over or what, but the first episode, I, I liked 1899. I didn't love it. It was interesting. 1923, the first episode, I'm like, oh, is this going to be kind of like 1899? Is that with it Harry got, Ford? Yes, it got Henry, uh, yeah, Harrison Ford is in it, Helen Mirren. It got better every episode, and I love it. It is oh, so really? good. I can't believe how much I like it. It's vi- It gets way better every episode. What's the story? It's just the Dutton Ranch in, nine, it's it's hard to, uh, after World War One. one of the sons is kind of messed up. Okay. It's, it, there's some ties to 1899, but you didn't have to watch it. It's very good. But one of the funny things was, they're walking into town in, in the 1920s, and this is when refrigerators and uh, washing machines first started coming up like you could have them. And the, the guy is trying to sell them, and he said, hey, if you buy a refrigerator and a washing machine, your life is so much more efficient. You can just, and they're like, well, what are we supposed to do if we get these? They're like, you have a life of leisure. And the one guy goes, no, 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 no. If we get these, we're going to have to work more to pay for them. And mm-hmm. so he's like, those luxuries become a necessity. I thought it was a very good. And then, then you find yourself having a tomahawk ribeye with, that tastes like a uh, brisket. That's true. I tried Wednesday on Netflix because it's such a big phenomenon. Not for you. And, uh, not for me. Yeah. Uh, I. It's kind of, to me, it falls in the Harry Potter category of, I think it's very creative and there's good performances. Like the girl who plays Wednesday is very good. I watched two episodes, but it's just, it's not my thing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's not for me either. I, I, I don't think so. And I flew through the chair on Netflix. It's a What's six episode show. It's a, I think it's from last year, maybe 2021. Sandra O oh and... One of the Duplass brothers, the Duplass brother who was on Industry, who I didn't think he was great in Industry, but I loved him in this one. It's just a show about an a, a English chair at a college, and it's kind of teachers versus students and how students on college campuses act these days. It's a half-hour one. It's one you can turn your brain off on. They, for some reason, didn't pick it up for a second season, which I think is fine because the whole first season to me was just like a one long movie, and I enjoyed it. Not not great, but good. What That's did I watch I this week? Not much. Not much. Um, oh, the second episode of Last of Us, I got to be honest, I liked the first episode. So the first episode of La- The Last of Us, I was like like everybody else, I was all in only because I have such conviction and uh, just zero doubt that HBO is just the best at what they do. There's not even, a, I mean, I you know, in terms of quality, there's not, there is no number two. It's, it's HBO and everything else. But I, I thought the first episode was like, you know, I didn't love the first episode is what I'm saying, even though I knew the season was going to be great. I loved the second episode, loved it. It's good. That's a great show. Did you love the second episode? Yeah, we're even we're even staying five minutes after the show and listening to like the director, the creator of the show talk about what they're doing. Oh, it's, I know uh, that's a thing. Yeah. I should do that. Keep it going. Uh, it's good. You know what sort of came and went? Josh mentioned this that he liked it. The Will Smith movie on Apple Plus or Apple TV or whatever it's called. I feel like got no what was it called? Emancipation? Yeah. We pulled uh, it up the other day and thought, eh. Nobody's I haven't heard a thing. No. Nothing. I think, I think Will Smith kind of just, he tanked his career. Think so? Yeah. Could be. Um, all right. Uh, nominees came out for the Oscars. So this is what's on the list for best picture. By the way, it's, 10 is too many. All right. All Quiet on the Western Front. I started that to not finish it. Um, Avatar, The Banshees of Insurance, Elvis, Everything Everywhere, All at Once, The Fableman's Tar, Top Gun, Triangle of Sadness, Women Talking. Come on, this is the year. Just, just stop. don't be so uh, stuffy. Just top give it gun. a Top Gun. Just do yeah. it. And give TC stop his taking career achievement. So best actor. Is he nominated? I think so. I thought he wasn't. No, he's but not. Maybe you're okay. right. Maybe he should maybe be. You're right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm. Look, come on, it's Top Gun. It's got to right. be Top Gun. Send us an email: analspiritspod at gmail Next week, Michael's going to talk about how they got his order on McDonald's. They put pickles on. He didn't want them. (laughs) See you next week.